So I have to record it just a minute. My IT person is doing it. Auntie Nancy, how's, oh, oh, it's fuzzy. Oh, now it's straight. Okay. We have a great IT department. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to show this little video for Hokulea because um, I also learned a lot of um, our Hawaii people also didn't know about this um, voyage. And um, I want to give a shout out to Auntie Kylie Oshiro at Moanalua Elementary School for inviting me to share with her students about the history of Hawaii right in from Oregon to Hawaii. So um, mahalo to her. And I'm going to share this video and it's been such an honor, and I just want to reach out to all of our Hawaii people, learn about our Hokulea voyage. What they did was incredible, and um, we need to be proud. We need to be proud of that. So please um, take the time to uh, learn about our worldwide voyage. <laughs> Seven thousand years ago, the first really oceanic people came out of China, and came out of Taiwan. Then you get to Polynesia, this oceanic country bounded by Hawaii in the north and New Zealand in the southwest, and Rapa Nui in the east. Ten million square miles, bigger than Russia, and it was discovered by these extraordinary people. They were really the astronauts of our ancestors. They were the greatest explorers on the face of the Earth. Unaided by modern instruments, these extraordinary explorers discovered and settled every livable landmass in the Pacific, relying solely on a complex understanding of the stars, the winds, the waves, and other cues from nature. You know, our ancestors now were only just great navigators. They are great stewards of these islands. The time that the first Europeans came, the journals of Captain Cook talked about, you know, large populations, maybe 800,000. That, that's the median. It, it could be even higher. It's approaching maybe the numbers of people that are living on Hawaii today. They figured it out, how to live well on these islands, and I think that is the challenge of the time for planet Earth and all of humanity is to figure that out. How are you gonna do that? Hokulea is pulling us into a direction of asking the question, are you gonna be responsible and are you gonna take action? Are you gonna do something with what you have? You got a voyage and crew. In a generation, Hokulea has sailed over 140,000 nautical miles to reunite the world's largest oceanic nation. Today, Hokulea voyages around the planet with the message of Malama Honua, or caring for island earth, with a firm belief that blending traditional and modern technologies will help us find our way to a healthier future. Hokulea, to us, to go around the world, has this enormous potential to go to 40, 50 countries on the planet, to be with the great navigators on earth. And I'm not talking about those in canoes. I'm talking about those who are doing things to give kindness and compassion to the earth and those who live on it, those navigators. We're not going to change the world, but we're going to go and build a network of people around the earth who are going to change it. And our job is to help them be successful. TV, also another great informational outreach that you folks can um, reach out to if you folks want to learn more and you want to, you, you want to learn more, really, you want to learn more. Um, again, one of the things that, you know, for this Hokulea, this voyage, I'm going to move this over if you guys can see, yeah. Um, Hokulea is pulling us into the direction of asking the question, are you going to be responsible and are you going to take action? And that's one of the foundations of where Malamohonua, this project for us started. Are we gonna be responsible? And are we gonna take action? And as 
many of us know malamohonua means you know to take care of our earth but it's more than that yeah it's not just earth it's also us we are also our own honua and what are we doing what are we doing to malamohonua what are we doing to not only our earth but what are we doing for our culture what are we doing for our people what are we doing for the next generation and um we were very blessed to also learn from Lanakila in December and he came up to Olekona and he did Mana'o Manakia here and that was one of the things that stood out after listening and following the Hokulea voyage and listening to Uncle Naino Thompson and then hearing from Lanakila asking like what are we doing you're here on this land no forget where you come from don't forget your roots and remember who you are but what are you doing here and that's where this that is really where this exploded to this just the rise of the manao of what are we doing came from those um those words from uncle nainoa thompson and lanakila um and auntie nancy over here who's my it person auntie nancy actually had um found this native american talk at the oregon historical society and linda mianis was there and it was from that moment too that we learned that there was just this iini, yeah, a, a true desire um, to learn about the Native American culture. So I'm also going to share a little bit of that so you folks can understand why we are also wanting to connect to the Native American ohana. Well, I have to relearn the language because I was born in school myself in Oklahoma at uh, Riverside Indian School, so I went to school. Um, but my great-grandfather, the chief, Tommy Thompson, he never had an education. And my great-grandma, Flora, she only had second grade. But both were very wise, very smart. For back in those days, you know, they didn't felt that being native was important. And so when my grandfather, his uncle had passed, who was chief then, became chief when he was 20 and lived to be 114 when he died. So he lived on salmon every day, so that, that was the importance of trying to keep our, our, our keep Salilo Falls was because of our salmon, because it was our way of life. It was our survival. And so when they took that away, my great grandma Flora said that my grandfather died of a broken heart because that's what he lived for, was to keep the salmon. Most people don't understand how much injustice and hardship our people have endured already. And we haven't left. We're still here. The attempts to evacuate people, annihilate people, assimilate people, have been experiments that have somewhat failed, thank God. Our people have an intestinal fortitude that nobody else has because this is our country. You can't get us out of here. And the same is true of the river. We're always going to be, no matter what they do to the river, pollute it, dam it, change it in many, many ways. No matter what they do, it's still our river. And I think people think that you have to have property rights to own something, but that's not the way the river is for us. I mean, we belong to this place, we belong to this river, we belong to these tributaries that our people had villages on, and that's never going to change. The only thing that frightens me is not having the knowledge about those places and about those lifeways and about the technologies and the language that expresses all of that. That scares me. But the notion that we're ever going to be separable 
from this land, it's unfathomable to me. The reason that we continue to do these things is I think an important thing is that we're honoring our ancestors. And um, as we do that, recognizing that things aren't stagnant, that things were always changing. As we do some of the traditional things, we actually incorporate more modern um, contemporary kind of things. Like if we were making a basket, we might make something that's like a wallet or something like that, or something that's a little more contemporary and people can see a connection to it. This still has a use today. It's amazing that um, you know, people do see these as, as old ways of things. Why do we continue them today? But it's amazing how when we practice these traditional ways and things like that, people are recognizing that there's still a connection of importance to what's going on. Like here in the Willamette Valley, fire was very important to our tribes and how we maintained like the huckleberries and the oaks and the camas areas and now fire is being re-looked at as an important management tool. Um, but that's something that our tribes did for, from time immemorial using those traditional ways. We had to come back and fight for our standing, a thing called recognition. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We were here all these centuries and then in our own land, we had to fight to be recognized as a people, a people who built highways on our trails, a people who built ports on our landing sites, a people who took our resources uh, for their own wealth building, and then tell us, we don't recognize you you have to prove to us that you were ever here. So in the Cowlitz to Manawas tradition, we did. We built and documented in such a way that we wore the government down. They couldn't deny any, they couldn't find an excuse any longer. And they had these burdens and burdens of, uh, they, it became probably burdensome to them, but they had, we, we gave them all the different documentation process that they required to be recognized. And when that happened, I don't think we ever looked back. We all originated down at the Columbia, along the Columbia. And when the Salilam was there, it was good. We, we did that, but just the river itself still means a lot to us because we are a part of that connection to that water. And we consider ourselves uh, from the Wayam, which is the Columbia to us, it's called William. And then when they, when they decide to move us, move us back this way, they found places for us to, which they call the reservations. And, but we know where we came from. And so when we, we talk about that, we, remember what Silala was about, but that was taken away, and so we don't stop there and, and try to cry over spilled milk. We continue on to allow that, that water to be a part of us, and we're still part of the way I am. Oh, I am back on. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So I just wanted to share some of those videos. I know I um I shared them last week, but I just wanted to kind of give you folks a background 
of why we are doing Malamohonua. And it's an eight week. Last week we started off with Ihao and we honored the Tlingit tribes. And uh, this week we're going to be honoring Kauai as well as the Chinookian tribes. But um, just a little bit side, I know. I know I'm taking it to my side. I know. Um, today our Ohana drove down from um from Beaverton and we drove around White East and we came through uh the east side of or of Olekona, which I've never been on this side. And uh, through all of their research and all of the teachings and everything that we learn um from confluence, um and just listening to the stories, it was such a different drive. And I'm trying not to cry. If it looks like I'm crying, it's me because the light is bright. Um, we're driving through this area and we're driving through Warm Springs and to know the, the challenges that the tribes have gone through and are still going through, but to be able to have seen Oregon in a different light, to, to, to be able to drive here and, and look at this land from their perspective versus us just coming down to Sun River for vacation and Ben and all of that, you know, all of us, that's what we've been doing, right? Um, go to the coast to enjoy, you know, a couple weeks ago, we went out there to um, to take a look at one of our other Hui's, they're gonna be sharing, I'm not gonna give it away, to be to look at our, the tribes there on the coast, but it was just amazing to be doing that now. And we hope that this program, Malamohonua, honoring Hawaii when you go home every time I go home I'm always in awe of Hawaii right even though growing up there I'm always and it's always such a a blessing to share what we've learned growing up especially with people who grew up in Hawaii and it's their first time seeing it you know it's such a beautiful but to be living here and and driving through warm springs and next to the Deschut rivers and seeing the painted hills and all of that and, and learning about the people who discovered these lands when reality these people those people you just saw in the video have been here centuries and they're still fighting for their land so we hope that through this program it brings awareness it brings awareness for you folks and um and you folks to make that initiative make that extra effort to not just vacation here in oregon learn about it and when you go to hawaii don't just vacation in Hawaii. Learn about it. So we're building connections and a better world for the next generation. Last week, we had these cute, our cute Keiki join us. Um, unfortunately, that's not what we did today. So we're going to have like the cute group of Kauai <laughs> join us today. So um, with that being said, mahalo for joining us. I'm going to invite our Kauai and Chinookin group to join us as I stop sharing my screen. Kalmai. Oh, sorry. They told me what I was supposed to do. Excuse me. One second. Before they come on, I'm supposed to cue it on. Okay, hold on. Hold on, guys. Hold on. Sorry. 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 So, again, I'm going to welcome them as I share their screen. I was crying too much. That's why. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Aloha, my name is Mema. I'm a freshman in the Beaverton School District and my pronouns are she, her, hers. We would like to welcome all of you to what we hope will become a safe and open what kind of presentation. As a member of this community here in Oregon, we would like to acknowledge and mahalo the land and its people to which we sit and occupy. The Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Klamath, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalafuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River, creating communities and summer encampments to harvest and use the plentiful natural resources of the area. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. So without with that said, aloha mai kako for this year's Eala e Building Connecting Project. Our group will be presenting the Mokupuni Kauai, along with the Chinook Nation, who are indigenous peoples to Oregon and Washington. So I Next, slide. Slide. Next slide. Next slide. The overall 
question that our group is focusing on in this project is how do we discover what Kanaka people can do in order to preserve, protect, and perpetuate traditions and cultures? Going more in depth with this question, we're wondering how today's generation helps influence our youth about the importance of preservation, sustainability, cultural awareness, and education of the issues that Native Hawaiians and Native Americans are facing today. Next slide, please. Mano Kalani Pole is known as the oldest of the main Hawaiian islands and is nicknamed the Garden Isle because of it, the expansive tropical rainforest that covers the island. The island is also known for its raging waterfalls, Opeka'a Falls, Hanakapi'ai Falls, Ho'opi'i Falls, Wailua Falls, and many more. Kauai is also known for the pa'akai that is produced in the salt beds of Hanapepe. Pa'akai is handmade unprocessed salt, exceptionally rich in ocean minerals, and renowned by Hawaiians for health, healing, and spiritual properties. Most of the land used for salt making was lost to industrialization or sold. Hanapepe salt, made near the southern coast of Kauai Island, is the only remaining traditionally cultivated salt in Hawaii. The tradition of salt making is passed down through generations of families, and each family has their own section of the salt beds where they cultivate the pa'akai. Next slide, please. Pa'akai can be used for many things such as cultural practices, traditional meal preparation, medicine, and spiritual native practices. Different levels of the pa'akai are used for different things. The topmost layer is the whitest and commonly used for table salt and cooking. The middle layer is a slight pink hue and is also used for cooking, while the bottom layer is a deep red brown, which is only given to fishermen or used in blessings. Next slide, please. Here are two pictures of the Kanaka people in Kauai who are preparing the Hanapepe salt beds by smoothing out the clay and making the pa'akai, uh, for making the pa'akai. The preparation harvesting of the salt beds start in the beginning of the summer or hot season so that it is easier for the clay to stay in its molded shape, along with the water being able to crystallize into pa'akai due to the weather. The molding process takes about seven to 10 days. It also depends on the number of Kanaka people coming to help. However, it also ends during the, the rainy seasons. Next slide, please. In the pictures to the left, it shows um, two men collecting the produced pa'akai from the salt beds by using a rake. And the, on the right side, it shows the final product after the preparation and harvesting. And again, Hanapepe salt is not a commercial product. Tradition dictates that it cannot be sold. It must only be gifted, or in some cases, bartered. That means that every single piece of pa'akai in the salt beds is valuable to those who harvest it. They want to be able to collect as much as possible, whether it's going to be used in ma'ai, food, ceremonies, or blessings, gifts, and many more. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. In this picture um, is Ahupua Ohana Pepe. From this bird's eye view, you can notice the numerous numbers of the Hana Pepe beds during its harvest. Ahupua Ohana Pepe holds the Vahipana of Waimaka o Hiiaka in the Ili of Ukala Hawaii State Registry of Historic Places. And, oh, are we still screen sharing? Maybe. Sorry, Kule. Yeah, we got connection, you good? Yeah, Let me put the slide to... back up and then we can continue. Kalamai. Okay. And we I... are still, I believe. Um, slide eight, please, when that's a good time. Okay, Kalamai, Kalamai. Can you tell me when it's slide eight? Mm -hmm. 
Um, is this slide eight? I can't see anything. Mine just says that you are screen sharing. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Picture it in this slide okay, of the varieties of pa'akai. The white uh, seawater pa'akai and the orange red alai pa'akai are from Hanapepe. Alai is a unique red salt made with addition of Kauai's iron-rich volcanic soil. Red in the salt pans represent the blood, cocoa, of our ancestors. The black salt, wahi, is made from the black smoke that rises from coconut shell charcoal, which gives it the distinctive color. This black wahi pa'akai was not made in, was made in Hawaii, but not at Hanapepe. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. No, maybe. Um, did the slide change? I, oh. Okay, sorry, we, oh, are, sorry, back we are back on. Kalamai. Kalamai. Kule, can you hear us? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Okay, Kule. Call my auntie is on a hot spot, so that this computer just has a hot spot. And we're gonna start again.
Mahalo for your shins. Hanaho from you guys like eat. Got it. Let's try this again. Okay, so um, pictured in the slides so the varieties of paakai, the white seawater paakai and the orange red alai paakai are from Hanapepe. Alai is a unique red salt made with the addition of Kauai's iron rich volcanic soil. Red in the salt pans represent the blood cocoa of our ancestors. The black salt wahi is made from the black smoke that rises from coconut shell charcoal, which gives it the distinctive color. This black wahi paakai was made in Hawaii, but not at Hanapepe. Next slide, please. With modernization, climate change, and development, some hazards have arisen, putting the salt beds in jeopardy and preventing the production of paakai. Pollution is one of the most prominent problems. When it rains, the runoff from the roads to the beach contaminates the salt beds and the nearby airstrip creates noise pollution and blows dust and debris into the water. Another threat is the unpermitted restroom facility um, on the nearby airstrip, which has the potential to leak into the ocean. Traffic along the shoreline also reduces the natural sand barrier that protects the beds from the waves, contributing to flooding. Climate change is also having an impact on salt beds, causing rising sea levels, increased rain, and change in weather patterns. Next slide, please. The caretakers of salt beds have been working on ways to protect and advocate for the Aina to counteract some of these threats. They hope to enact a driving ban on the road right by the Hanapepe salt beds, but it would still allow people to access the beach on foot. To reduce pollution, it would be beneficial to upgrade the surrounding sewer systems to reduce leaks. During Hanapepe salt beds, turning Hanapepe salt beds into a no-fly zone for the airstrip would also reduce air pollution and sand being blown into the beds. Opala trash can be reduced by organizing and promoting litter pickup campaigns and a barrier between the parking lot and Lo'i should reduce people bringing their litter close to the salt beds. Next slide, please. Efforts are underway to raise awareness for the preservation efforts of this ancient art. The 2020 Kamehameha Schools Annual Song Contest contained an entry by the sophomore women class entitled Hei Kia Aloha Aina o Waimaka o Hi'iaka, dedicated to honor those who protect and perpetuate this ancient Hawaiian practice. Our own Kumuhula, Hula teacher, Lealoha Kaula, has been challenged by the Hakumele mentor the composition mentor to the students to choreograph a hula to it. Huihana Paakai Ohana Pepe is a Native Hawaiian organization composed of 22 ohana that are kia'i or stewards of the land. These cultural practitioners have perpetuated the tradition and practices of the salt making era, area, which has also been listed on the state inventory of historic places. Currently, they are working on establishing themselves as a 501c three tax exempt charity. Doing so will allow them to pursue fundraising opportunities that will sustain continued outreach efforts and legal assistance. The Hui is also looking at the benefits of seeking a national historic landmark designation as a means of protecting the Hanapepe Paakai Lo'i Mahipana, which means sacred place. In addition, they are currently working with Kauai County Council on the West Kauai Community Plan in an effort to implement some of the protections to the item mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. To close the Kauai uh, protection portion of the presentation, we would like to share a quote from Kuule, Kuule Santos, one of the Kia'i of Hanapepe. For every tradition, you need your kupuna, you need your keiki, and without this, it won't thrive and continue. 
And you need us in the middle generation to help fight to keep it protected. Uh, next slide. Mahalo to Uncle Dennis Fujimoto and P.I. Lani Kali for being able to provide us the pictures we use in order for the audience to have a clear visual sense of what the preparation of Pa'akai looks like, along with the Hanape Pe salt beds and the Aloha Pilina connection, Kuliana responsibility when it comes to continuing and preser preserving this tradition. Another huge Mahalo to Auntie Malia for all the Ike Mana'o you were able to provide for us through this project for the Kauai side of this presentation. Our group was very fortunate to have this opportunity to sit down and discuss with Auntie Malia about the importance of the history, its teachings, and its gift Pa'akai provides for Kanaka Hawaii, which is also known as the people of Hawaii. Auntie Malia is a native educator, cultural practitioner of preserving the tradition of Pa'akai, Kumu Hula, and an advocate when it comes to standing tall for indigenous rights. Auntie Malia is also the current president of Huihana Pa'akai Ohana Pepe. Huihana Pa'akai Ohana Pepe is a Native Hawaiian organization where Kanaka people, made up of 22 Ohana, stand tall as the cultural practitioners, kia'i, stewards, and protectors of this Fahipana sacred place. To be able to have this opportunity of exchanging work with those who believe in the arts and work of their people is what makes this Malama Honua project so special. Next slide, please. When we look around the Portland area today, we see a modern city. But this same area was once a thriving, prospering community of a very different kind when its first inhabitants, the Chinookan people, made their homes along the banks of the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. There were many bands of Chinook inhabiting two million acres of what is now Oregon and Washington. The bands that make up the current day Chinook Indian Nation highlighted on the map were those along the lower Columbia, closer to the coast. The band of Chinook that lived in the Portland Basin are often referred to as the Wapato Nation for the small root plant that was common here. Before Europeans arrived, the area where the Columbia and Willamette meet was the perfect place for tribes to come together and trade. Tribes living in the Willamette Valley and Plains brought goods from inland, while coastal tribes came in canoes up the Columbia. And it was the powerful Chinook Nation that controlled this crucial trade crossroads. The Chinook were also skilled fishermen and hunters. Early missionaries to the area were impressed with the Chinook and dip net fishing techniques and the way the whole community came together for the harvest, including men and women. Salmon and game were plentiful here and the wapato, which is another staple first food for the Chinook, grew in the soft mud of the riverbeds. With this abundance of resources, the Chinook developed a sophisticated culture and political structure. Other bands of Chinook tended to move to seasonal camps, but the wapato Chinook lived in villages year round. They stored large volumes of food and had a thriving subsistence economy. It's estimated that the Lower Columbia Chinook numbered as many as 15,000 when Europeans first arrived. Next slide, please. The first documented European contact with Chinook and villages was in 1792 when a merchant ship entered the Columbia. Early European explorers quickly realized the power the Chinook held in the region and an era of trade began. For their part, the Chinook were eager to trade with the newcomers, but they did so on their own terms. In the book, Chinook and Peoples of the Lower Columbia, author Robert Boyd writes, for the Chinooks, the way forward did not include an abandonment of their spiritual lives or traditional culture, but it was clear to them that their economic future would necessarily be tied to the capitalistic world the traders had brought to the Columbia. 
As with many tribes, European contact also brought unimaginable epidemics of diseases they had never encountered. Smallpox and malaria epidemics hit the Chinook in the late 1770s and continued in waves as each new generation of people were born without immunity. When the epidemics finally subsided, it's estimated that over 90% of Chinook had died. Among the Wapato Chinook, there were only about 600 survivors. Following the epidemics, most Wapato Chinook were removed from their villages or intermarried with white settlers and moved away. But families with ties back to the Wapato Valley Chinook are found among the Grand Ronde and Yakima today, as well as throughout the larger population of Oregon and Washington. For the other bands of Chinook, history took a different path. The mutually beneficial trade relationships with Europeans gradually gave way to a loss of power and land in a series of acts of colonization, which finally culminated with the Superintendent of Indian Affairs being sent in 1851 to negotiate a treaty with the tribe. The treaty council convened at Tansy Point and the two sides came to an agreement. It would allow the Chinook to remain in their traditional homelands. But before the treaty could be ratified, it was blocked by Oregon delegates who wanted the Chinook moved off their lands to a reservation east of the Cascades. Treaty negotiations resumed in 1855 with Washington Governor Stevens. And this time the Chinook proposed giving up 95% of their land so that they could stay on their ancestral homelands. Leaving the burial grounds of their ancestors was non-negotiable for the Chinook. In the words of the Chinook chief, we're willing to sell our land, but we do not want to go away from our homes. Our fathers and mothers and ancestors are buried there. And by them, we wish to bury our dead and be buried ourselves. But Stevens insisted that the Chinook join with several other Oregon and Washington tribes and move onto a reservation 100 miles to the north. The Chinook refused and Stevens angrily left the treaty grounds with no agreement. With no treaty in place, the government proceeded to take Chinook lands piece by piece. It refused to recognize them as a tribe. In the words of tribal member Leslie Ann McMillan, on the Tansy Point Treaty grounds at the mouth of the Columbia, our destiny as an ancient people was radically redirected and we became a diaspora of outcasts. Next slide, please. Since the initial treaty of Tansy Point, the Chinook have continued to fight for federal recognition. In 2001, the federal government finally acknowledged them as a tribe. As tribal chairman Tony Johnson describes, they basically apologized up and down, said we've made a huge mistake. We understand now based on the evidence that the Chinook Indian nation is in fact a community that should be acknowledged by the federal government as an Indian community. The tribe celebrated, but the joy was short lived. Just 18 months later, the Chinook tribal chairman was in Washington DC to attend a luncheon to honor tribes who had given aid to Lewis and Clark. But that same afternoon, he received a phone call to say the government had changed their mind. Federal recognition of the tribe was rescinded. Next slide, please. So what are the implications of a tribe being federally recognized? For the tribes themselves, as we heard from Collett's elder earlier, their essential identity as a tribe doesn't live or die by federal recognition, of course, but that recognition is important for a number of reasons. American Indian tribes existed as sovereign nations before the United States existed at all, and federal recognition is a formal acknowledgement of that sovereignty and thereby the tribe's right to administer their own government. It also means that the federal government has what's known as a trust responsibility to the tribe. Federal trust responsibility is the recognition that the federal government has an obligation to protect the tribe's land and resources and to provide medical, education, housing, and other social services to the tribe. A common misconception is that these services are provided as a kind of uh, entitlement program like Medicare or unemployment programs. But in fact, federal trust responsibility arises from the government to government treaty negotiations. And so those services are actually a payment for tribal lands that were ceded. It's under this trust responsibility that federal agencies such as the Indian Health Service bring much needed resources to tribal communities. And the Chinook, as we saw, have ceded close to 2 million acres of their traditional homelands 
and yet without federal recognition, they receive none of these services. So they have no tribal health clinic, tribal schools, or subsidized housing. And so much of a tribe's culture is interwoven with the resources of its homelands. The first foods, the place-based ceremonies, the materials to carry on traditional arts and other practices. But for the Chinook, without federal recognition, they have no legal right to hunt, fish, or gather in their traditional homelands. Next slide, please. In order to receive recognition now, the tribe must go through a complex process to prove their status as a tribe. Asking a tribe to provide this documentation of their ongoing cultural practices, political and social structure back hundreds of years when they've been displaced, fractured and forbidden to practice their language and culture. That's no easy task. But the Chinook have brought everything they have to bear. Cultural knowledge keepers, anthropologists, linguists, historians, lawyers. And for 169 years, they've been amassing an abundance of proof that they're still here. They have always been and they're not invisible. In the face of so many setbacks and with limited resources, the Chinook have persevered. They continue to fight for recognition. And as you'll hear from Mema and Selin, they keep their culture and tribal identity alive for the next generation, hoping to practice it in their homeland again one day. The tribe's not asking to take land from other tribes or non-natives. Since as Chairman Tony Johnson put it, we know the nightmare of somebody coming and taking everything you own. Instead, they hope to be granted federally owned land within the Chinook Historic Territory. In 2015, the Interior Department blocked the Chinook from seeking federal recognition. But last year, that ruling was overturned, and today the fight continues. I think the words of Gary Johnson, former Chinook chairman, describe the importance of recognition to the tribe the best. All this land tells stories. These rolling hills near Astoria, Americans come and level it and build on it and plant on it. But to us, that place has a story. If we're not recognized, we can't pass this on. We've been here for 10,000 years and we'll be here for 10,000 more. We need to start thinking in that time frame. I truly believe that people knowing those stories, knowing that history will make them treat this place differently and make them take care of this place with that attitude of thinking 10,000 years ahead. And I'll hand it off to Mema and Selin to continue. The Chinook Nation has especially been hit hard this year with the coronavirus and raging wildfires. Because the Chinook, Chinooks do not have federal status, they do not have a health clinic or any ability to track how the pandemic is affecting their community. Additionally, concerns have arisen about future wildfires harming their homelands and not having control to prevent and intervene if this happens. Next slide. Chinook culture is strongly connected to the earth. Each body of water, mountain, and piece of land plays an important part in the natural balance of life. This was disrupted when the United States stripped their homelands forcing the Chinook Nation to find creative ways in preserving and celebrating their way of life. Carving is one practice that plays a key role in art and culture. Wealth posts, long houses, burial canoes, and everyday objects all were carved in wood, bones, and stones to honor specific people, something they've done, or mark a significant location. Chinook art was less focused on legends and creation stories than their neighboring tribes. Traditionally, materials were gathered from the land to make pieces of art placed back on the land. Today, these practices have adapted to focus more on honoring nature and family histories than they did before. Modern, modern Chinook artists now add their own artistic flair into carvings and sometimes even work in different mediums such as painting on pieces. The two pieces on the right side are made by the modern Chinook artist, Charles Funk. Here, the two traditionally functional crafts have been made as decorative pieces to be displayed. This also goes with the Chinook Nation flag emblem on the left. It represents a Chinook salmon with the Chinookan people's face in the center, symbolizing their, con their connection to each other. Traditionally, this would be carved on or painted image, but they've di digitized it for their web presence. Next slide. 
Shenikins continued to return their craft back to the places they belong, such as restored plank houses, Cathlapolto village and Ridgefield and the waters of the Pacific Northwest. Cathlapolto was a large village with 14 plank houses, one being restored in 2005. The lands are now owned by the Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge and are used for educational outreach as well as a gathering place for Chinooks to meet and have ceremonies. The carving located inside the plank house and the painting located at the entrance is an example of Chinookans sorry, <laughs> using their artistic skills to honor the land and roots of this craft. Canoeing was arrived in 1989 in a similar way that the Hokulea and Polynesian Voyaging Society revived sea voyaging. The canoe journey is a yearly event for the Pacific Northwest tribes to travel and visit several local indigenous communities over several days. This gives Chinookans an opportunity to carry on canoe traditions and connect with other tribes in nature. These art and cultural practices will continue to adapt and be revived with the purchase of the Dixie Point Treaty Grounds land, located just east of what is now Fort Stevens, Oregon. Here, the Chinook Nation plans to build a cultural community center, a plank house of their own, and provide space for hunting and canoe launches. This is a big win, as they will now be able to bring back traditions to a part of their homelands. Leslie Ann McMillan, a Chinook Indian Nation member and descendant of Chief Come calmly looks into the future saying, we will reassemble as dignified owners of the treaty grounds, resilient Chinook people honoring the creator, to find the site, enjoying the lands and waters that nurture familiar trees, plants, wildlife, and birds, and our namesake salmon along its shores. We will identify and tend the natural resources that have been our renewable sustenance since antiquity. Next slide. Education plays a big part in preserving cultural heritage. The Alvina Frisbee Scholarship provides a way for young mm. Chinookan Nation members to gain the skills and resources within the globalized world to later help their community at home. So far, this scholarship has awarded over $200,000 to over 80 students. Part of preserving cultural culture involves sharing it with others. The Chinook Nation has public events throughout the year, such as oyster fries and canoe races to raise to raise awareness of their existence and educate local communities on the surrounding environment. Another way they do this is through the media. In 2016, the Chinook Nation and the Duwamish tribe released an award-winning documentary, documentary together called The Promised Land. In it, they talk about their people's history and the fight for federal recognition. Here are some similarities and differences when it comes to comparing Kauai and the Chinook Nation. So some was in Kauai, Kauaians lived in Ahupua'a where their numbers were estimated between 20,000 to 40,000. Also Kauaians carved the canoes from the chunks of the trunks of the koa tree. However, both groups employed canoeing to navigate waterways and fish. Both were considered expert seamen and both populations of both peoples plummeted upon contact from Caucasians due to such as smallpox, measles, pertussis, and malaria, along with intermarriage with whites. And then in the Chinook Nation, Chinooks lived in villages along the Columbia River, where it is estimated up to 50,000 lived pre-contact, along with the Chinook tribe did carve their canoes out of Western Cedar. So. Our group had the idea of creating Pa'akai of our own from where we live in the Pacific Northwest. Mayma and I were very fortunate to have the opportunity to travel to Lincoln City this past July and collect approximately one gallon of ocean water from the Lincoln City Beach. Here next is a small clip of how the ocean water crystallized out in the sun because of the hot air evaporating the water to create small, cube, small salt cubes. So in the beginning, we just grabbed a normal stone from um, the side of our house. And then we laid it in the, in the sun and put it in a pan. And then obviously in July, it was very hot this season. So it was quick than normal for the salt cubes to crystallize. And you can see them at the bottom of the pan, some on the side of the rock. And then later on, it got a little bit dirty because of the air and the wind. But, and we just took it off of the stone and the pan and we let 
it dry off in I the air again on the one way. last time. So our plan of action, going back to the beginning of this presentation, the goal that our group was striving for was to be able to preserve and perpetuate traditions and cultures by the end of this project. To answer this overall question, we're inspired by being able to see and have others use resiliency as a way of taking action within protecting the lands of Kauai and the Chinook Nation. The first thing we could all do is to educate ourselves and expand the Mana'o knowledge to others. A saying that Auntie Molia once said when discussing the different numbers of Kuliana as Kanaka, people must take was, how do I mentor the next generation? She talked about what others from all over the world can contribute in order to create awareness, to create pathways of seeking your aina, land, from keiki, children, to becoming a mokua, adult, and then a kapuna, elder, so that they can watch the growth of what their honua has once preserved and continued. Here is a link to a video if you want to find more ike knowledge on how Kanaka and Kauai produce the paakai along with its culture or agriculture. As a little side note, our group has also created a crossword puzzle that we crossword puzzles that were based off of the Hanapepe Hanapepe salt preparation and about the Chinook Nation. And this link can be found on our website, which will also be linked later on in our presentation. So the second way about resiliency is to get involved politically. Specifically, this could relate to reaching out to our own representatives in Congress. And then finally, support our cultural practitioners by visiting our website to find more links to learn more. Also, check out the Chinook Nation social, social media, such as Instagram and Facebook, for more information about upcoming cultural events for the public. So when it when it's when supporting our cultural practitioners, we are able to protect, preserve, continue the making and teachings of Pa'akai. Next slide. <laughs> we would like all of you to ho'olohe listen with us to a mele entitled Naki Aloha Aina o Waimaka o Hi'iaka. Again, this mele was created and composed by the Kamehameha students for this year's 2020 song contest as an example in creating awareness for the next generation. Hanapepe is unique to the culture of farming salt, a largely laborious task. Water is set in beds called waiku and eventually crystallization salt. The last time salt was farmed was about six years ago. This is due to a number of reasons, human destruction, weather change, and the most prominent is a recent helicopter company wanting to fly directly over the salt ponds. The path over the salt ponds by helicopters would contribute pollution, noise, and chemical runoff, which already the salt ponds are facing. This is the last of the cultural practice we have. Once gone, this is one less thing we are doing to practice and perpetuate our culture. This song is dedicated to the work and love that goes into this culture practice by the families and those who take care of the land.
Here is a link to our website, which provides a wide variety of links to, sor to sources where you can find more information about the Chinook tribe, along with the history of Pa'akai tradition in Monokalani Pole. In our website, we have also created Chinook and Kauai crossword puzzles. If any keiki, child, makua, adult, kapuna, elder, want to test their ike knowledge about what they have learned in today's presentation. Mahalo nui loa for tuning in to our presentation for this evening. We hope that this project has not only brought awareness to the events in Kauai and the Chinook Nation, but to you too. Mahalo. Yay. Mahalo nui loa to Auntie Nancy Thompson, Auntie Donna Ching, Janine Denkovshik, um, May McGarvey, Celine Dutro, Kule Yarbrough, and Lena Alavas. Um, if I miss anybody, <clears throat> Mayma still sitting next to me. She wanted to say Mayma Kamala Mala McGarvey. Kalmai, that I didn't say her whole name. Um, I want to mahalo them. Again, please make sure we're going to have this information up on our website as well as uh, their website that they have created, their own website. So this is super awesome. Um, we hope that you have taken the time. I'm sorry, I'm trying to stop share. There we go. Um, you folks enjoyed this presentation, um, learned a little bit about not only about Hawaii, but also about here. Um, please support our ohana there on Kauai in Hana Pepe. Um, please support their protectpaakai.org. If you can see, uh, we have our website to support them as well as our uh, Chinook Nation. Um, please visit their website as well to support um, anything you can continue to learn like Mema and their group are saying. Please make the effort to take your to take the time to educate yourself. Um, we have the opportunity. We have, um, and the information is provided for us. It's out there, so we can definitely learn. So make the initiative. Um, remember, what are you gonna do, and how are you gonna take responsibility? That is our kulena. So again, mahalo for joining in. Mahalo nui to our hui, um, to all of you folks. And we will see you next week as we head to Kakuhi Heva, to the island of Oahu. And we honor the Selech tribe as well with our hui next week, Friday at 6.30, same time, same place, um, better internet. Aloha. Oh, of course, thank you, Nancy. We did it.